This is a special presentation of Farm Journal Television. Hey, you found us. I'm Clinton Griffiths and welcome to Corn College TV. Today, we're taking a sharp look at a microscopic enemy. Nematodes can rob yield and profits from producers. Today, we're looking at their impact, how to spot a problem, and tips for getting your farm tested, and managing residue after harvest, taking care of what's left behind so the crops ahead can flourish today on Corn College TV. Welcome to Corn College TV with field agronomist Ken Ferry, associate field agronomist Missy Bauer, Farm Journal's Margie Fisher, and host Clinton Griffiths. Hello there and welcome to class. Here at Corn College TV, we're working hard to give you quality tips and topics to think about as you plan for this upcoming growing season. Today, we wanna to take a look at a problem you've probably never seen, but likely have seen the effects nematodes. I caught up with field agronomist Missy Bauer for a closer look. Well Missy, let's start with a hidden issue that a lot of corn growers may not think about and that's nematodes. Let's, what are nematodes? Yeah, corn nematodes are actually a plant parasite so if you look at uh, university you wouldn't go to the entomology department to find out about these which is what most people think of it as an insect and it's not. So it's more in the plant pathology department being a plant parasite. Right. So it's actually a microscopic tiny round worm. Yeah. And if I go and dig up in my field, dig it up in the soil, I, I can't see it in the soil. No, that's right. They're very, very tiny microscopic so we're not going to be able to see them visually with our own eyes. So. The only way to know for sure would be having to analyze at a lab. Okay, and, and whenever we visually analyze our field, that's when we can really see what kind of damage has been done. And you brought some examples here. Yeah, we do want to look for in our field symptoms uh, of the damage. Um, the plants themselves where we have nematodes are going to be stunted, uh, smaller plants. It's going to end up looking like a nutrient deficiency or herbicide damage. And that's what makes this so okay. difficult is a lot of times it gets misdiagnosed for another problem when right. it's really nematodes because the nematodes are hard to detect. So we see in, in areas of fields you'll have like a circular area in a field or irregular shape mm -hmm. and we'll go out there and you'll see that the heart of it is really stunted bad, the corn is, and then you get away from that a little bit more and, it, and it's a little better and then you move out away from that and the corn looks normal. We actually have an yeah. example of that okay. here that this was from a field where the corn looked normal right? and we moved in just a little bit. This from here to here would be within 10 foot of okay. one another and we have a plant that's stunted and you can see what that risk system looks like and then we have an area what we would call bad and this was the center of our nematode area and you can see the damage that's done to the roots and how much right. smaller of a root mass we have. Here. Now are they eating the roots or does it depend on what kind of, kind of nematodes we have? Yeah what the nematode does is they do feed on the root so okay. they live in the soil they'll feed on the root there's different types of nematodes some nematodes actually do live inside the root majority of them live in the soil and okay. just feed. So they're either going to feed on the inside of the root or the outside of the root depending on what type they are. But the damage they do, a lot of times you're going to um, damage the tip of the root, the root hairs, and you're just not going to have that root grow properly anymore and you'll lose your depth of rooting. Right, and you won't see the size of roots that you're going to need to have those high yields. That's correct. So what do we do? How do we solve this problem? Well, you know, from a management perspective, uh, in the past, we haven't had a lot of opportunity other than working with some insecticides. Uh, uh, old insecticides like a counter can relative, be relatively effective on nematodes. And, that, and a lot of people don't use that anymore, right? That's right. It's kind of considered one of those harsher chemicals that a lot of farmers don't like to handle. So we're looking at some new technology that's just coming out from some uh, seed treatments. So it's mm. actually a treatment that's on the seed. Uh, one of them is a uh, nematicide, another one is more a biological approach, which is right. something we're seeing more in ag as well. And, and what you're seeing is that if you can protect that seed and the, that plant early, then it may have a chance to survive or, or do better against the nematodes. That's right. You know, nematodes are going to start attacking, you know, within four to six weeks after that plant's in the ground. And we're trying to protect this first set of this root system that comes out. We call those the crown roots. We're trying to protect those from the nematode damage early in the season. And if we can get these roots protected, then these are the roots that are going to make the foundation of our yield, so then we should be all right. Corn College TV is brought to you by DeKalb. For all season strong performance and results you can take to the bin. Go with DeKalb. Gets results with strong roots and strong stocks for performance you can take to the bin. Go! 
Go with industry-leading DeKalb genetics and proven Genuity trait technology, letting you get more from every acre. Go all season strong. Go with DeKalb. Mark your calendar. Ag Connect Expo 2011 is coming to Atlanta, Georgia on January 7th through the 10th. Connect with experts. Learn new ideas, new technology. Connect to the future of agriculture, the newest innovations. Connect globally with producers from around the world. This show sets itself apart from the regional shows. Ag Connect Expo 2011, where the world of agriculture comes together. When you apply nitrogen to your soil, on average, more than 30% is lost after application. 30% just literally disappears into thin air. So if you want healthier crops and bigger yields, the answer isn't applying more nitrogen. The answer is Agritain. Ask your dealer for Agritain or Agritain Plus. Hello folks, this is Mark Gold with Top 3rd Ag Marketing. If you need help marketing your grains or livestock, give us a call. We offer one-on-one -on -one relationships that can protect you without the threat of margin calls. We don't speculate, we manage risk. If you're tired of paying acreage and management fees for marketing advice that hasn't actually helped your bottom line, then give us a call. Call today to get two weeks of Mark's private grain marketing email. Top 3rd Ag Marketing, earning the trust of American farmers every day. Missy, a lot of people get excited to get out in the field and start harvest, but there's really some work they can do pre-harvest, such as scouting. That's right. We feel it's really important to do some pre-harvest scouting for a couple of reasons. One is to get an idea of what your ear count is, because when we go through the combine, we might have our yield monitor tell us our yield is, or you know, when we weigh it at the, at the end with the trucks or whatever across the scales, but that really doesn't tell us if there's something in that field we could have done better. Right. So we like to evaluate ear count, how many ears per acre did I have in comparison to my plants, and was there some improvement I need to make there? Right, right. And then the second part of it is standability. You know, the last thing we want to do is harvest down corn. Right. So we like to do some pre-harvest scouting where we go in and do some checks for the quality of the stalk so we just can de determine if we've got certain fields that maybe should be harvested earlier than others. And a lot of that depends on hybrid, hybrid I assume. Yeah, that's right, what hybrid it is and whether or not we had any nutrient deficiencies and whether or not we had drought conditions or a lot of stalk rot where we had a lot of rain and opportunity for stalk rots. Okay, well let's, uh, let's do the ear count first. Uh, how do we start that? Yeah, what we want to do is measure out our thousandths of an acre. So in this case, this is 30 inch rows. So we'd uh, stretch our tape out 17 feet, five inches. Then what I like to go through and do is actually peel back the husks on okay. these ears. So we can get an idea and actually physically see what that ear looks like. You know, sometimes when we're doing our ear counts, um, we could have what we'd almost call a half an ear. So we'd like to be able to see these so we can separate those out in our actual ear counts. Okay. So in this case, if we go through and start to actually count the number of ears that we have out here, we ended up here with actually 38,000 plants and 36,000 ears in this irrigated cornfield. Okay. So. Are there some you're not counting? Yeah, that's right. In some cases when we're doing this ear count, if we've got some of these guys, uh, for example, here as a, a lady merger, so it didn't come up uh, on time, then he didn't pollinate well. So we're going to minus okay. him off. And then the other thing we'll have sometimes uh, is what we'd call kind of partial ears or half ears. So you can see uh, this ear, for example, here, if we take a look at it in comparison to some of these real big uh, nice full ears. It's certainly an ear. I think we can get this harvested, but if we compare it to this, it's really not where we want to be. Right, not so the same size. So we'll go ahead and count that as a half an ear. Okay. Uh, and in this example, we had we had two of those, which ended up being a minus one, plus our lady merger, so we had a minus two. Okay. So when we look at this, we've got 38,000 plants, 36,000 ears. Um, that differential of about 2,000 uh, is within tolerance. If we're in a corn soybean rotation, we like to have that on average within about 1,200. But in a corn on corn rotation like this is, we'll allow that to about 2,000 on average. So uh, that's what we're going for. Again, in an irrigated field, we're going to be pushing populations high like we are here today. Okay. So then how do we know if we have enough ear population out here? That's right. When we're trying to determine, when we do our final ear count, some people ask the question, was that 
enough? You know, do I have enough ears right. per acre or do I, do I need to push my populations higher? So one thing we're always looking for is what's it look like for tip fill? I really like to see a little bit pulled back off the tips like we have here, about that half to an inch uh, on the end of those tips that are actually pulled back. That tells me that these plants had enough competition between them that they were going to do that. Now if I come out here and every one of these were filled right out to the very tip, then that tells me I could handle in this soil type and these conditions more population and then I'd want to go ahead and think about increasing my population for those hybrids uh, the following year. Okay, so let's talk standability. That's the other part. That's right. When we're looking at standability in the field with this pre-harvest scouting, what I like to do when I'm walking through the fields is do what I call the push test. So just go through and as you're walking in there, kind of push back on these stalks and see if it feels like there's any weakness at all. Uh, if, I, if I go ahead and push back on it and it wants to kind of snap or break down here, oh, right, yeah. then now I know I've got a potential weak stalk here. Okay. So then I'm going to want to do a little bit more investigating. And what I'm going to do is actually look at the insides of some of these uh, uh, plants and stalks. We're going to go ahead and actually split one open. Okay. And what does the inside tell us? What we're looking at is what kind of um, cannibalization we have in here. In other words, when this plant goes to actually start to fill, um, it's going to take all the nutrients out of here and uh, move them up into the ear. And right. if that happens too early, then we get what we call uh, the cannibalization of the actual stalk itself. What it looks like in the stalk is um, actually kind of, we call it this cottony or uh, uh, kind of a styrofoam look to it. Right. Okay, and it feels different and it doesn't have a lot of moisture content. Sure. So if that's happening out in the field and all the way down to what we'd call the bottom or near the crown of the plant, we'd start to be concerned. So when we're splitting stalks open, ideally we like to have uh, these bottom couple nodes still what we call clean. In other words, it doesn't have this styrofoamy look to it here. Oh, okay. Okay. So in this case, like this example, um, you can see we're cannibalized all the way down to the bottom. Right. So if we had a lot of this going on in the field, we'd say I'm concerned about harvest, how long this is going to stand for. Maybe I need to think about um, making a harvest list order. In other words, go to some fields earlier than maybe you would have because of the standability issue. We're going to go ahead and talk about nematode sampling for corn nematodes. So we have two times of the year that we can do this sampling. We can either do it here right at harvest time or we can do it earlier in the season. If we're going to be out there early in the season, we're looking at four to six weeks after planting that we want to pull our samples to capture that early time frame when we have a small root zone. The procedure in general is going to be uh, somewhat similar whether we're out here in the spring or at the end, end of the season. When we pull our cores themselves, we're going to want to make sure we use this probe and we're actually going to try to probe through the root zone. So we're going to come in here with our soil probe at a 45 degree angle, about four to six inches away from the base of the plant and pull our sample. The sample cores that we collect, we're going to put into a Ziploc bag uh, for our sample uh, and put all of those together. We'll do about 10 to 12 cores uh, on average. If we're harvest, or sampling at harvest time, we want to have a 12 inch core because these nematodes have moved a little bit deeper. If we're doing the four to six weeks after planting, we're going to be looking at more of a six to an eight inch uh, sampling depth. So that, that will depend a little bit based on the time of the year. We want to be uh, careful when we pull our samples that we are trying to keep these nematode uh, samples alive. So we want to handle them with care in these Ziploc bags and make sure that we uh, bring a cooler along to keep the samples in. They're going to be very temperature dependent. We don't want these samples to get too hot. So we can keep our samples in the cooler uh, while we're doing that. So that's a few of the basics as far as sampling for nematodes. If we have what we call a hot spot in the field, we're going to approach that a little bit differently. So this is an area that we know is a bad spot. When we go out there to do that sampling, we're going to, uh, tendency is going to be to walk into that bad area and pull our samples there. But what we actually want to do is move out to more of what we would call this stunted area and pull the samples there. Uh, as you can see, we have some plant samples that I brought from an uh, area that was uh, nematode pressure in. And we have a sample here of a bad area, which is this plant here. 
the stunted area and then the good area and we can see a big difference in what these plants actually look like. So when we go to pull our samples, if we only go and pull in the center of that bad area, we may not uh, have a very representative sample. In other words, these nematodes will spart start to move away to try to get into a better feeding area. So we want to pull these samples actually more in that stunted area. Uh, an example of what we had pulled here, where we had went out into the bad area, a sample came back with only 10 nematodes in it. Where the stunted area came back with 472 nematodes in it, and the good area came back with like 166 nematodes in it. So we do need to pay attention when we're sampling these bad areas that we move into more of the stunted area where the nematodes have moved to that better food source. So those are a couple tips for doing corn nematode testing. Coming up after the break, managing residue after harvest. Getting the work done right can pay big dividends next season when Corn College TV returns. Avail Phosphorus Fertilizer Enhancer is designed to increase your fertilizer efficiency and can boost your yield potential by 10 to 15 percent. How do we know? Well, first we tested Avail in a series of university trials that across different states, different counties, different fields and farms just like yours to prove that Avail will keep phosphorus available for the entire growing season. Avail has been proven around the world and that's good news for your crop as well as your wallet. So visit chooseavail.com and see where Avail takes you. The global market, it takes some forward thinking. At Bauer Trading, we're trading the future today. Watching the four corners of the earth for market activity, Bauer Trading compiles and analyzes information, develops strategies, precisely times implementation, and continually monitors global events. Jim Bauer's vast experience in this process is why investors, large and small, trust him. Call Bauer Trading at 1-800-533-8045. Bauer Trading, global experience at work for you. America needs to know that something still works in this country. One of those things that is working well is agriculture. And at U.S. Farm Report, what's crucial to me is to make sure we convey the confident, competent voice that I hear from America's farmers and rural residents, that they can count on us. Rural America works. Agriculture works. Watch U.S. Farm Report Saturday morning and Sunday afternoons on RFD-TV. U.S. Farm Report, the spirit of the countryside. Rust is destroying your valuable equipment and property. Rust Guy permanently stops rust the easy way. No scraping, grinding, or sandblasting. Brush, spray, or roll Rust Guy onto any rusted metal and it will not rust again. Rust Guy is not a paint, but an industrial strength formula that kills rust on contact. It leaves a smooth finish that can be left as is or painted. Rust Guy protects from salt, manure, fertilizer, urine, and rain. Call 888-RUST-GUY to talk to a rust expert or go to rustguy.com. In today's Ask an Agronomist, viewers want to know about nitrogen inhibitors. Ken Ferry answers the question, how do I make a smart nitrogen inhibitor decision if I decide to use one in my operation? That's definitely a good question. I, I, especially this year, for some reason, I've found a, a lot of growers maybe not understanding all the different types of inhibitors out there, and they're using the wrong inhibitor in the wrong spot and that may be kind of costly and in money and at the same time it may lead to a loss of nitrogen they weren't expecting. Two basic inhibitors out there as far as types. Uh, we're going to worry about volatility of nitrogen which is a loss of ammonia nitrogen um, from the volatility of urea. So urea comes of course as urea granule applied to the surface and then your liquid uh, applications of 32 or 28 percent are half urea. When the urease enzyme breaks down that urea, there is a period in there where we have ammonia that can be created, and if it's not incorporated into the soil through tillage or rain, it can volatilize and get away from us. And this could happen uh, in, in a matter of two or three days, and there could be a substantial loss, maybe 20, 30 percent of the urea portion of the nitrogen off the volatility. So that type of inhibitor has to be a urease inhibitor to stop that volatility. The other process is when nitrogen is converted into a nitrate from an ammonium source, NH4. And in this process, when it's converted to a nitrate, it can be leached away or it can be denitrified as a nitrate. And we need to stop the breakdown. And the breakdown goes from ammonium to nitrite to nitrate. And we need to stop the nitrosomonas bacteria from driving this process. So in this case, you're looking for a nitrogen inhibitor that's going to stop nitrification. 
totally different than the one that's going to stop your RACE inhibitor. So a person could put this type of inhibitor on, a uh, nitrogen application he made to the surface, and still consider, have considerable loss due to volatility. Or you could take this inhibitor, which is designed to protect surface nitrogen, and put it in your nitrogen mix and knife it in the soil, and it really wouldn't be needed because you're incorporating that nitrogen in the soil to prevent that type of loss. So nitrate loss, we can lose it through leaching in soils that have sandy soils and, and, and low water holding capacity, and we can lose it through denitrification in soils that have poor drainage. So we want to protect the nitrogen and keep it out of the nitrate form as long as possible. That takes a nitrification inhibitor. Surface applications takes a urease inhibitor. Two totally different processes, and you need to know what you're buying and what you're trying to stop as far as your nitrogen loss. Results with strong roots and strong stocks for performance you can take to the bin. Go with industry leading DeKalb Genetics and proven Genuity Trait Technology, letting you get more from every acre. Go all season strong. Go with DeKalb. Hi, I'm Greg Vincent, the editor of Bag Web, and welcome to our new site. This marks the end of many long months by a lot of us here at Farm Journal Media and also even some of our loyal readers who are dedicated to helping us remain the homepage of agriculture. This new site is designed to have more vibrant content, easier navigation, and faster load times while still delivering the same quality information that you've come to expect from AgWeb over the past 10 years. So go ahead and take a look around the site and let us know what you think. AgWeb, the homepage of agriculture. I've traveled around the world a lot. I've witnessed uh, what we're trying to address here, and that's hunger. There's six billion people on the face of the planet today, and they say there's over a billion of them that have poor nutrition. They go to bed hungry. And I come back home and I witness the incredible productivity that takes place in American agriculture across our country. Somehow we need to do a better job of getting the food to those people that are in need. I guess when I look at farmers feeding the world, I say to myself, what do we really hope to accomplish? I hope we accomplish a design of a system that has a legacy that goes on for multiple generations. And I think with the knowledge that is possessed within agriculture, the funding that is in, within agriculture, we can get this accomplished. Farmers Feeding the World is about agriculture coming together to increase both hunger solutions and food production. Learn more, give generously, dream huge. farmers be sure that they're ready to manage residue when they're following up behind the combine? And definitely it starts right behind the combine and, and uh, out here today we're you know, mid-September it's 80 degrees out. Uh, this is a gift for decomposing uh, residue. And when we talk about residue mainly talking about corn on corn and one of the challenges is we have to get as much of this decomposed in the fall if possible. That takes a lot more strain off of the the spring application so out here we're you know we're turning it black a few days after harvest so this has been harvested and we're burying that residue uh, starting the decomposition process process the soil is warm yet uh, so there'll be considerable amount of decay taking place here in september october maybe even into november it'll make corn on corn so much easier in the spring to do that, though, it's a, it's a management challenge because not only are you worried about harvest and getting your harvest done and getting it done on time, but you have to think about how do we get our tillage done to start the process for next year. So in a lot of cases, it demands a, a tillage team to be following up your combine instead of combining until you're done and then starting the tillage process. And that, that demands people and, of course, demands equipment uh, at the same time. Ken, today's hybrids are, are producing some healthy residue that are providing some challenges in the breakdown process. What should farmers keep in mind to tackle those tough residue situations? No doubt as we, as we get more traits in the corn and the corn is healthier and the tops stay in it, you know, years ago, by the time you got to harvest, the tops were blowed out of the corn. Well, um, that was a good thing because it started to decompose them already, but now these kind of bulletproof hybrids have to be taken down with the combine and they're... Um, stock structure such good shape it takes longer to decompose so 
The process of shredding stalks, uh, either with the combine itself or coming out in the field, can be an advantage. We would recommend that to make sure that we put some, not a lot, but some ammonium nitrogen in with the mix before we chisel it down to stimulate the breakdown of residue. Uh, and, and again, timing. As fast as we can under the drier conditions, we get better shattering of the soil and we get more time again to, to break these hybrids down so uh, we don't have to deal with them in the spring. That's easy to say here in central Illinois. It's probably not as easy to say when you get to Minnesota or Wisconsin and the harvest season is a lot shorter. Um, now, if we move to Tennessee, Kentucky, Arkansas, uh, maybe they don't want the residue to decompose as fast as they need to cover. So it really depends on how much residue problems you're dealing with and how fast you want to get rid of it. In corn on corn, uh, typically the faster you get rid of it, the less trouble that you have. In corn soybean rotations, it's really not a, that big of an issue. For today, that's the show. We're glad you spent part of your day with us, and we hope you learned something. Thanks for watching Corn College TV. Class dismissed. Corn College TV is produced and distributed by Farm Journal Television.